right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Doxy. Has this been some winter or has this been some winter? And it's not over yet. We got, well, at least on the calendar anyway, we got another five, six weeks. And who knows how much snow we're going to get uh, tonight. But we're ready, you all. I bet not, I, I bet not play around like that. <laughs> we don't want to have anything that happens that mars where we've been uh thus far anyway uh we're here this morning to announce uh more than two million dollars in uh grant awards for winners of the sustainable dc innovation uh challenge which is the second year uh that we've done this um glad to be here at pr harris uh, educational center which of course is one of the buildings that udc uh uses uh in its arsenal uh, buildings as a part of the uh, community colleges workforce uh, development program. And by the way, I was, I was just looking at Kim uh, Ford. We was a graduation was about a month ago uh, at H.D. Woodson, and what an affirmation of the role the community college uh, is playing and will continue to play in getting people back to work uh, in the city. Uh, we had. Uh, people graduating from a variety of experiences in the community college. But the headline to me was we had 929 people uh, who graduated that day, people who have gotten a different skill set than they had before they came into the community college and now are moving on uh, to be a part uh, of the, uh, the workforce. Um, the workforce development programs uh, at UDC provide critical job skills uh, training. Uh, the district residents that help promote their careers in hospitality, technology, uh, nursing, and uh, construction. Um, recently, uh, you all uh, undoubtedly know, and I've only told 973 people uh, <laughs> on, on 450 different occasions, uh, seriously, that our unemployment rate came down by half uh, a point uh, last uh, month at the end of December down to 8.1 percent from 8.6. And we know that some of that is attributable uh, to the work that's being done uh, by the community college. Uh, in fact, the unemployment rate, if you recall, uh, in Ward 8 when we came, in, soon after we came into office, was 26.9 uh, percent, which is one of the high, was high, one of the highest rates uh, in the nation. Um, and we've now come down to 17.7 percent, which is still high, but it is going in the right direction. I mean, think of that, a drop in unemployment of 9 percent, 9 points, uh, is a phenomenal uh, reduction, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, we, uh, we know that some of that's been contributed to by the sustainability uh, projects, and that's more than about parks and, and trees. It's also about a uh, philosophy that stretches across, frankly, everything uh, in the city. And it's about uh, building a city that is vibrant and livable for uh, all of our uh, residents. Uh, UDC, um, I think Dr. Lyons is here. I thought I saw Dr. Lyons. There's Dr. Lyons. How are you, Dr. Lyons? All right. Um, UDC, uh, like the other Innovation Challenge winners uh, here, has shown outstanding leadership in the uh, development and implementation uh, of our sustainable D.C. Uh, plan, and especially the development of green jobs in areas like urban agriculture and uh, environmental protection. Uh, as you may know, making the District of Columbia the healthiest, greenest, most livable city uh, in the country is one of the top uh, priorities for our administration. Uh, and is wholly consistent with the goal of sustainable uh, D.C. Uh, we're coming up on uh, one year of having the plan completed. Some of you will recall that we took, uh, we started this, this journey in July of 2011. Uh, we did a lot of work uh, with people over the next few months, uh, starting with a website in September. We had a uh, session at the convention center uh, in November and I had no idea how many people would show up. I th figured if we got 50 to 75 people to show up uh, and participate in that session, we could consider ourselves uh, a success. Uh, it wasn't 50 or 75 people who showed up. It was 400-plus uh, people who showed up to participate. 
And that led then to the development of the vision, uh, which, was, um, which was published, was disseminated uh, in April of 2012. And then we took almost a year to develop the full-blown uh, plan, which this is, of course. And so the plan has been out now for about a year, and we're making enormous progress. There are, I think, 143 initiatives uh, in this plan uh, to be achieved over the next, uh, what will be now, 19 years. Bye. <laughs> you think we'll all be here then, Brenda? <laughs> um, to be achieved by 2032. Uh, but again, something with no vision and no, uh, you know, no uh, arc, if you will, uh, is unlikely to make any real difference. So. Anyway, we're excited about that. Um, we also remain committed uh, to making the District of Columbia a leader in sustainability. We got a couple of awards from the U.S. Conference of Mayors uh, last year for the work that we had done. Um, and again, we uh, believe that we can become the most healthy and uh, equitable, if you will, city uh, and economically committed, uh, competitive in the process. That's why uh, over the past two years, I've invested close to $8 million uh, in targeted innovative projects that support the vision and goals uh, of the sustainable uh, D.C. plan. Last year, we funded a dozen innovation challenge uh, projects, uh, and they included one, one that I think is really high profile. That's the anti-idling devices in the uh, Metropolitan Police Department cruisers. Uh, we install those anti-idling devices in 91 uh, cruisers. And essentially what they do is allow the cars to keep running, but they don't burn gasoline. In the course of it, they run on batteries. And those batteries are uh, recharged at various points uh, of their being out there. Hopefully the, uh, hopefully the benefits are obvious, energy conservation, and also uh, reducing pollution uh, of the environment uh, from the fumes uh, being emitted uh, by gas-burning uh, engines. Um, beyond that, we also are implementing an environmental education program or programs in district schools, and we're installing uh, solar, uh, green, and uh, cool, if you will, roof systems on district government uh, buildings. Uh, this year, I'm delighted that we are able to fund another $2.35 million uh, in Innovation Challenge projects at district agencies. Uh, seven projects were selected based on a competitive process among our agencies. And again, remember, this is an, an internal governmental um, process, uh, competitive process, and we're looking now whether we want to extend that to other agencies uh, as we go forward with this and continue to proliferate uh, the plan. Um, we have directed funding where we saw the greatest potential to achieve our sustainability goals. So simply put, um, Every one of these projects has to fit within the framework of the Sustainable D.C. Plan and within the framework of the goals and priorities that have been established uh, within that uh, plan. Um, the winners today were chosen from among 16 proposals um, requesting a combined uh, total of uh, nine, almost $9 million dollars. Uh, I want to thank all of the agencies that submitted proposals and encourage those that did not uh, win this time to apply again uh, in the future. Uh, so, um, what the heck did I do with that? There we go. Uh, since we are, uh, since we're at a uh, UDC campus, uh, let me start with the awards to UDC and partnering uh, district agencies. Uh, the University of the District of Columbia, uh, in partnership with the District of District Department of the Environment, um, will establish a native plant nursery um, to provide plants to green neighborhoods uh, citywide and serve as a training facility for technical job skills in greenhouse management, plant propagation, invasive plant management, and habitat uh, restoration. It gives new meaning to being a native Washingtonian. Uh, <laughs> um, also, <laughs> also uh, the uh, facility will host short courses for local green jobs training. Uh, let me congratulate our DDOD director, uh, Keith Anderson, 
And uh, Dr. Lyons, I'm going to ask you to come up and join us also. I know he has some of his folks, Sabine O'Hara of the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Science. How many of you all knew that, the, that UDC had a uh, College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Science? Good. How many of you all knew that UDC had a farm? How many of you all knew that UDC had an endowment of $7 billion? <laughs> Properly so. Nobody knew that because it doesn't exist, right? Uh, in any event, um, I want to again, again congratulate our DDOE director, uh, Keith Anderson, and uh, the UDC uh, leadership. And um, let me see. We've got, uh, well, you all have a copy of this document, don't you? I hope. Uh, anyway, that will tell you the amounts that are connected with each one of the grants. So, uh, Director Anderson and President Lyons, I'm going to ask you all if you would like to come up and uh, say a few words and then bring anybody up with you who you would like. Thank you, Mayor Gray, and I just wanted to quickly uh, thank UDC for putting together this proposal. Um, just, you know, another trivia question. How many people knew that the District of Columbia had over 2 million square feet of green roofs in the city? How many people knew that? And see, and it's growing. And with the, uh, the, the nursery that UDC will be implementing, we'll be able to put native plants on these green roofs. Um, so congratulations to UDC, and great job, guys. Good morning. Um, our dean is really our spokesperson. I, I just show up for the photo ops with the mayor. <laughs> and, uh, but I do want to say to you that I'm very – there you go, you get it. But I do want to say to you that uh, the mayor hit it right on the head. We are very pleased with our role as a land-grant university, and, and uh, most of you may not be aware of that, and you don't necessarily think about an institution located on Connecticut Avenue having a farm, but believe it or not, guess who the person was who asked me and actually embarrassed me and said, Dr. Lyons, have you ever been to UDC's farm? <laughs> and then that came to the second cabinet meeting. Dr. Lyons, have you ever been to the UDC's farm? And Mayor, I left the second cabinet meeting and went immediately to the dean and said, Dean, if I don't do anything else in life, take me to the farm. And so, I'm, I'm, but I'm very pleased to be at a university uh, that works so closely with the district uh, to do the kinds of things that, that our mission requires us to do. And Sabine, you want to talk more specifically about the project? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, Director Anderson, Dr. Lyons. Um, we are honored to receive this award and delighted to continue our collaboration with DDOE. This native plant nursery uh, will allow us in the district to actually combat invasive species. Um, if you've ever been in your backyard lately, you probably have crawly things growing over all your bushes and trees. Those are invasives that are not native to this area. But you can't just pull them out. You've probably experienced that. You've probably tried that like I have. Um, and they keep coming back unless you replace them with native plants. And then you restore the, the natural habitat, the native plant habitat that is native to this area. And so we're delighted to support our colleagues in DDOE with this project to be able to restore some of the natural plant habitats in this area. And I would be remiss if I didn't recognize my staff, and particularly Mary Farah, who will be heading this project and who is the mastermind. Um, behind this idea. Thank, thank you all. All right. UDC also will receive a grant to establish um, a business incubator and training kitchen to promote nutrition education and entrepreneurship uh, in the food industry. And uh, I know that's wholly consistent with some of our uh, community college uh, goals uh, also, as well as obviously our sustainable D.C. Uh, goals. Um, the facility will allow urban uh, food growers to receive specialized training and food processors to prepare food for commercial sale. 
This operation also will include a uh, food truck that will travel throughout the city with healthy food preparation demonstrations. And the university will build and operate at least three aquaponic farms. Uh, some of you all are familiar with aquaponic farms. Good. Okay, fantastic. Um, we, uh, we've opened a farm not far from here, uh, across the way here. Yeah, right, right across the street. Um, and that has, well, I think it's 100,000 square feet uh, of space with brighter farms that we're working with uh, on that. Uh, these farms are places where fish and plants are raised uh, together, uh, and they will provide training for low-skilled and semi-skilled D.C. residents while increasing access to healthy food uh, in underserved uh, neighborhoods. So, UDC, come on back up. Kitchens first. So uh, the idea is to create a commercial kitchen that serves as a business incubator. Um, you've just heard about the agriculture and horticulture side of the land-grant programs um, under the College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability, and Environmental Sciences, short causes. Everybody knows us as causes, right? Um, but there is, of course, more to the land-grant programs than simply food growing. It's also about food processing. Um, and teaching people how to do that in a safe and sanitary way and to uh, start businesses based on that. Um, f freezing, drying, canning, making jams, jellies, and so forth. And in our work with communities, with neighborhoods here in the district, that we have a lot of very talented people um, who feel very strongly about their own food traditions and some of their ethnic traditions related to food. And so this kitchen will provide an opportunity um, for these folks to um, learn how to do that commercially and then to use our farmers markets here in the district as a venue um, for, for marketing their products and um, for commercializing their businesses. So we will offer around this uh, commercial kitchen uh, food safety certification programs, uh, cooking, uh, food demonstrations, but also nutrition education, and of course, entrepreneurship courses, because you also need to know how to write your business plan, um, if that's the kind of venue you go into. So the kitchens then serve as incubator hubs. Thank you. Oh, aquaponics, do I get to talk about that too? Very good. Aquaponics, and we already have one small facility operating on Martin Luther King Avenue and, of course, out at the farm. Aquaponics links um, fish production with vegetable production, where the excrement from the fish serves as fertilizer for the plants. And that's uh, what makes it, of course, very interesting commercially as well because you won't ever have to buy fertilizer if you do it right. But, of course, as you can imagine, doing it right is no trivial matter. Um, because balancing that uh, fish and food production uh, takes a lot of skills. And so the aquaponics facilities serve as training hubs as well as, as viable businesses um, to grow food and fish, protein and healthy produce. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, we have adopted your sustainable DC plan and have sort of m modified it as, in short, Healthy cities means healthy people. And that's what these facilities, of course, seek to contribute to. And I want to recognize Associate Dean Hare and Dr. Dwayne Jones from our Center for Sustainable Development and Professor Karkovich, who've all contributed to these projects. Um, and the distinguishing mark about our facilities, our aquaponics facilities, is that they're very small. So you can actually put them on a parking lot behind a townhouse on very small spaces um, because we've um, gotten, come up with a new concept for aeration that makes it possible to shrink these usually swimming pool size fish ponds to the size of a hot tub. And so that makes it possible to have these facilities operating in densely populated urban neighborhoods. And so we're very pleased to share that kind of innovative concept and uh, to continue to expand it here in the district. Thank you. I know all of you have been dying to know more about fish excrement. 
<laughs> and now you do. <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Office of the uh, State Superintendent of Education, uh, which, of course, is headed by uh, Jesus Aguirre, in partnership with the D.C. Public Schools and the Department of General Services. And one of the things we have encouraged in all of these grants is agencies coming together to do things effectively, uh, working together. Um, they will build an outdoor classroom uh, in a school garden uh, to support environmental and health education with hands-on examples of renewable energy, uh, storm water management, which is hugely important to continuing to clean up the Anacostia River for those who follow uh, that. That's one of our hugely important goals. We have established, as you may recall, from those of you who have repeatedly read the uh, Sustainable D.C. Plan, uh, I apologize for being redundant, uh, but we have repeatedly said that we want to make the uh, Anacostia River fishable and swimmable uh, by 2032, which I think is absolutely an achievable goal, uh, despite the fact that only 18 percent of the river is actually in the District of Columbia. 82 percent uh, in Maryland uh, through the Chesapeake Bay uh, Commission to work with our partners in Maryland uh, to be able to improve the condition of the Anacostia uh, River. Um, in any event, uh, the classroom will be built with sustainable materials and will serve as a model for outdoor classrooms at other schools. So let me congratulate our state superintendent, uh, Jesus uh, Aguirre, uh, for having uh, achieved uh, this milestone and congratulate you on this award. Mr. Superintendent. Good morning. Um, I'll be very brief. Just wanted to thank, of course, the mayor for his ongoing vision with Sustainable D.C., uh, the work of directors Anderson and Tregoning and their teams for pushing us forward here. Uh, this is an exciting project, and I want to thank our team, uh, Sam Mullery, who, who's too young for, for the nickname he gets at the school gardens. I think they call him Mole Man Farm or something like that. Um, but, but his vision for pulling this together and really building on the, on the very successful school gardening grant. Thank you, and, and Dr. Schlicker and Nancy for your work here. We're excited to work with, with obviously, DC, DGS and because they build everything, and we're going to work closely with them on this, but also with DCPS on the programming and making sure that this does, in fact, become a model, and we're going to create a guide that will take the, what we learned from this classroom and, and hopefully continue to build more in the classroom and the, across the district. So thank you. Good morning. I've been asked to keep it brief. So um, when I was 10, <laughs> no, it's a, this is a, a great pleasure. And of course, I love the chance to be able to work with Jesus again on this great project. And uh, you know, DGS is committed to fulfilling the mayor's vision for a sustainable DC, and we're going to continue to push on that front. Thanks. My name is Brian Pick. I'm the Chief of Teaching and Learning for D.C. Public Schools. On behalf of the Chancellor and my colleagues at the school system, we're, we, uh, we appreciate Aussie taking the lead on this project. Uh, we're deeply committed to outdoor education, uh, environmental literacy, school gardens, and the ability uh, increasingly to ten, send fifth graders to overnight uh, experiential ed uh, experiences you know, within 30 miles of the district. So this is one piece of the puzzle of expanding environmental literacy for all of our students. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Uh, our District Department of Transportation uh, will be working in partnership with the Departments of the Environment, General Services, and Parks uh, and Recreation. Um, they will install rain gardens and other low-impact development features to reduce stormwater pollution from the streets uh, surrounding Oxen Run Park, uh, which, of course, is right here in Ward 8. Uh, these permanent stormwater management facilities and the green infrastructure will help uh, restore and clean uh, oxen uh, run. Um, again, along with uh, Keith uh, Anderson, who's our director at DDOE, I want to congratulate again uh, DGS for the uh, work they do to help us move along. And they, um, along with uh, Brian Hanlon, uh, Sam Brooks, I think has done a, an outstanding job uh, at DGS also on our sustainability goals. <coughs> and we have joining them uh, our DPR interim director, Dr. Sharia Shanklin, 
and um, the associate director of um, DDOT, Sam Zimbabwe, will be here representing Director Bellamy today because Director Bellamy uh, could not be here. And I know he won't mind me saying this, uh, but the reason why Terry is not here today is because his father passed away, and uh, he is in North Carolina uh, with his family, which is exactly, of course, where he should be. So uh, I know our hearts go out to him um, as he works his way along with his family uh, through this difficult time uh, that they are experiencing. So, again. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak on this. I think this um, this project really shows what the Sustainable D.C. Innovation Challenge Grant is, is meant to do, which is bring together uh, agencies that don't always have a reason to work together to, to sort of make take best advantage of what we, each of our strengths bring to us. Um, we've got our DDOT uh, stormwater team here in the in the audience, Meredith Upchurch and Carmen Franks, um, who really spearheaded this project, and we're, we're just really excited to be able to partner and, and show what kind of innovation we can bring to the um, – to the Ward A community and, and Oxen Run. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to thank all of my distinguished colleagues that are with me. And of course, I would like to acknowledge our operations team who are the creative minds behind all of our Be Green and our Move, Grow, Be Green. <laughs> Bridges Destiny, our <laughs> business <laughs> operations <laughs> chief. Yeah, Stacy West, Ellen Faulkner, Joshua Singer, and Xavier Brown. Thank you. All right. And uh, DPR, in partnership with uh, DGS, uh, also will restore two long-neglected greenhouses to support uh, public access to healthy food and nutrition education. Uh, the project will establish a cooperative management uh, program with D.C. urban agriculture and nonprofits and organize a uh, especially uh, for our uh, young people. So um, the, they will all, DGS and DPR working together also uh, will install a new splash park that captures and reuses rainwater uh, for jets and sprays and irrigates adjacent uh, athletic fields. So <laughs> same agencies, I thought we'd do them together, right? <laughs> By uh, recapturing uh, rainwater and using water on site, uh, this facility will reduce the uh, use of potable water and relieve pressure on the district stormwater uh, infrastructure. Uh, we think this will serve as a model for other DPR uh, parks. So, uh, again, receiving both of these grants, which total uh, obviously $692,000, we want to congratulate both uh, DGS and DPR uh, and DDOE for working cooperatively in order to make this happen. Again, we're very proud to be recipients of these awards, and I want to acknowledge Joshua Singer and Xavier Brown for the greenhouse proposal, and Ellen Falter and Stacey West for the Splash, Splash Park initiative. You know, as I congratulate all the agencies that were selected uh, and their partners who are working with them on these seven projects, um, one, I think it's important to uh, point out that they really demonstrate uh, the spirit of innovation. And uh, they're probably projects that some of you listening out there say, what the heck are they talking about? Uh, but this is really the future, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if we want to be able to have truly a sustainable and sustained uh, city, these are the kind of things that we will have to do uh, in the years ahead. And it's going to take years to really see the full impact of this because we're changing ways of doing business, but more importantly, we're changing people's ways of thinking uh, about the environment. You know, we get people thinking differently about our waterways or thinking differently about how we produce uh, food or how we engage in recreational uh, activity or 
how we instruct our young people uh, in our schools around uh, environmental literacy. Those are hugely important uh, things. So I get excited about it. I want everybody to get excited about it, and I suspect the day will come when it won't be so much people getting excited about it. It will become an inherent part of the landscape uh, here in the District of Columbia. And uh, we, are, we are well ahead in the District of Columbia. There are others who are looking at our sustainability plan and adopting features of it to be able to do in their own jurisdictions. And frankly, that is, that is good news uh, for uh, all of us. Um, how about another big hand for those who were awarded grants today? Uh, I'm going to ask them to stay up here um, and uh, see if there's any questions that you all might have uh, on the on the projects that got awards today. Again, right, 2.35 million, Donna, is the amount total in the aggregate, and these are very significant grants because these are dollars that are being invested in ways that would not be invested otherwise uh, in the city. So. This is innovation, and I think people will look back on this time and um, actually um, acknowledge that this was an innovative time uh, for the District of Columbia on the sustainability front. So let me open it up to any questions uh, that you all may have. I think I'll start a day until you all actually <laughs> ask a question. It, it, it really is, I won't say disheartening, but... Um, it is not exactly heartening uh, to uh, not have a question or two asked about where we're going with this, but that, if that's where you are. I know all your questions have been answered, right, <laughs> Mr. Sherwood? Well, Mr. Mayor, I have to say you were very thorough. <laughs> uh -huh. We're not getting into bovine excrement now, are we? <laughs> million square feet of rooftop green space, two that's million. Right. How many? Two million. Two million. Most in the nation. Okay. Right. I'm done. The sustainability package, I know that the, the, uh, the, there was additional legislative components of this that you submitted. I mean, w w what's your sense on it? Is that moving? Are we, you know, we've been talking about styrofoam ban, among other things. I mean, can you give us a status report on that? And is there other things that you're going to be looking at it in the coming yes, months? Uh, Keith. Uh, to come up. There are, I think, I think there are 11 or 13 provisions uh, in the bill, in the omnibus bill that we submitted. Ri initially, we had a bunch of different bills. Uh, every one of the bills was different, and we decided that they are, you know, inextricably linked uh, to one another. And you're right, it includes, uh, in part, uh, a ban on the use of uh, styrofoam, and it has a number of other features. So, gentlemen, if you want to talk further about it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And yes, there are 11 pieces to that omnibus bill, and it is moving. Uh, we did have the hearing uh, on those on that omnibus bill, uh, maybe I believe about three weeks ago. So it's in committee um, as we speak. Um, Brenda, did you want to elaborate? It's, it's in Chase Committee, Chief, Chief of the Transportation and the Environment. So, do you all want to highlight any of the features of the, the provision? Just quickly. Well, the, the one I'm most ex excited about is the one you hit right there, is the ban on styrofoam. Um, when we look at some of the um, issues that we're dealing with with the Anacostia River, styrofoam is a, a big issue. Um, we've seen the success of the bag bill, and we look to see the same success uh, with the styrofoam uh, piece moving forward. So that's one of the ones that I'm most excited about. Um, as the mayor alluded to, uh, one of our top priorities is the, the restoration of the Anacostia River, and that's a big step towards that. All right. Thank you all very much, gentlemen. And thank you. No other questions on this initiative and the grants uh, today. Uh, we hope that this, again, becomes an annual part of the, um, uh, of the grant giving process in the city because it is a great way to stimulate change. Uh, I do think that we might add other agencies uh, in the private sector uh, in the future so that we incentivize our district government agencies especially to work together uh, but also that we have private nonprofit organizations that are working as well uh, to move us uh, forward. Mayor, can I ask a question about the 
Uh, the, the grants that were awarded, any stipulations on, on, on how they spend that money, any restrictions on, or, you know, are they targeted, got to spend it exactly, you know, specifically on the service, how much can go to administrative costs, that kind of thing? Yeah, that's, that's they have to be focused on what the uh, purpose is uh, of the grant uh, in the first place. And DDOE is responsible for oversight uh, of those grants uh, as well. Uh, if there is a, if there is a desire to deviate, which there could be, because we're we're in uncharted waters to some extent, um, they would have to submit a request for a change to DDOE, and uh, that would be considered and probably approved if there's a worthy purpose uh, associated with it. But by and large, we would expect people to follow us um, in consistent with the uh, purposes which were outlined uh, in the grant uh, in the first place. Um, I don't know how many of you all have seen, this was the first round, of course, and I alluded to this earlier. I don't know how many of you have seen the cruisers on the street that are sitting and they're using batteries. Uh, we even demonstrated one at one of these earlier bi-weeklies uh, a few months ago. Um, they're using batteries to uh, power the cruisers, uh, not burning uh, fuel. And if you, if you stand there long enough, you watch them, they will, simp they will start up essentially by themselves. Uh, in order to recharge the battery, in order to make sure that the uh, vehicles themselves uh, produce energy that is produced by other than fossil fuels. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, thank you all very much. And, you know, if you look at the clock, what you talked about time efficiency. Uh, you can see we started at about um, exactly what time it is on that clock. Right there, that's when we started. <laughs> have you all ever noticed, I don't know what it is, how many schools have clocks that don't work properly? And of all the places that we should have time properly displayed so our kids will learn from it is the school. I don't know what that is. Anyway, Mr. Sherwood. Clock always uh, stands still when you're in school. Uh, <laughs> but on a serious subject, Mr. Mayor, uh, yesterday you had to cancel some of your events and you spent time in the hospital with Mayor Barry. Uh, give us an update, if you can, um, of how, what you talked about and how's he doing. Well, mostly what we talked about was uh, he, went, he, he called me. He, he called me and asked me to come. And, uh, you know, if he calls and asks me to come, I'm going to do that. And uh, I spent several hours uh, with him. Um, I, I, I don't know what the – I didn't even talk to his doctors. I didn't ask him specifically what, you know, his medical condition is uh, at this stage. Um, but, you know, I think we all know Marion Barry. If you get Marion Barry into a political discussion, it's like he just, you know, he just grows 10 feet uh, at that stage. And that's what he really wanted to talk about. Uh, he wanted to call up some people, which we did. He wanted to, uh, you know, talk about what I'm doing and whatnot. And, Many of you know, I've known, I've known uh, uh, Council Member Barry, Mayor Barry, for probably 30 years. Um, uh, when I was in the private sector, he, uh, he was the mayor, uh, and I worked on, uh, worked on peop issues affecting people with mental retardation. And um, our goal was to be able to close an institution and get those people into the community. And um, even though he didn't know a lot about the issue in the beginning, he learned a lot about it, because I think we all know how bright uh, Mayor Barry is. And uh, we worked together. We became the second state in the nation, uh, preceded only by New Hampshire by a couple of months, to be institution free. Uh, so, you know, we talked about, uh, talked about politics uh, for the most part because that's what really thoroughly energizes uh, him. And um, that's pretty much it. And you had plans to go back to see him. He's apparently yeah, doing better this morning. He seems to be him. tweeting uh, more this morning. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I am. Uh, I keep in touch with him uh, as much as I possibly can. And again, not to be redundant, but you know, when he calls, when he called and said, "I really need you to come," uh, that was an easy one. So I went. I spent. Uh, I was there probably five hours, maybe six hours, uh, with him yesterday, and I was, it was delightful to be able to do that. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, <laughs> he's not going to let an opportunity go by. And, you know, it isn't so much that he asks me uh, what it is that's going on with the campaign. He has lists and lists of advice. Uh, for <laughs> we, we, we all know Marion Barry, and he has an idea on <laughs> 
every campaign imaginable, who we should call. He even called, he even called the political director for my campaign, you know, while we were there because he wanted to talk with him, you know, and tell him what he should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? That was fine with me because it energized him. And, um, you know, it was a moment where I felt uh, that energizing him was an important thing to do. We take from this that you expect some point of public endorsement from Marion. Well, I don't know. He didn't. He didn't publicly endorse me uh, yesterday. He didn't even privately endorse me yesterday. But uh, you know, it was encouraging to have him call me and ask me uh, to come and uh, be with him uh, during this this you know period of health challenge uh, for him. So do you have any sense of when he might be able to get out of the hospital and return to work? Is that something to be talked about at all? No, I didn't ask him about that. He didn't address it. I think we all know Marion very well enough to, the, to know, though, that, um, you know, if they would let him out right now at uh, eight minutes to ten. Oh, it's still eight minutes to ten now. <laughs> if if, if he, he would probably be on his way to the Wilson building uh, at that moment. But I think that's going to be a decision that will be made by his, uh, his, his physicians obviously in concert with him, but I think mostly by his position. So I really don't know. It wasn't discussed yesterday. Would you describe him as he was braille or he was just physically, he needed to just physically recover? I mean, it sounds like he was mentally on his game. He's just, you know, he's tired, he's weak, he's just. Um, I think we all know that he's been grappling with health challenges. I, I can't, uh, Mike, go into the details because I don't know uh, what the details uh, are. Um, but. You know, yes. It's not like he's unconscious there in the bed. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was frail after five hours of conversation. <laughs> 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 yeah. Distracting him. Uh, but you know, it was it was very uplifting to me to go and see him and spend that time uh, with him. And it was even more uplifting that he, he called and asked me to come. And he had told two other people the same thing. Uh, you know, I want Vince to come. Uh, Snow? Snow. What? That's, you know, TV. What a winter. winter. That's, all that exists for TV is snow. What's happening? <laughs> well, the last prediction I heard was 8 to 10 inches. Uh, I, I saw Bill Howland. Where's Bill Howland? There he is. <laughs> Hey, by the way, while Bill is coming up, are you all aware, you must be aware that we are now, um, you know, delivering new uh, super cans and recycled cans. And uh, Bill has not only promised to uh, make sure they get delivered, but he's going to sweep the snow off of every one of them. <laughs> you know, on that subject, I've gotten some complaints that that mailer that went out to everyone looked like a campaign flyer. I, I didn't do that flyer. I, I, I actually saw it when it came to my house. But it did look pretty good, didn't it? <laughs> it did look like a campaign flyer. Maybe Mr. Howland can answer that question. Yeah, we just announced that uh, we were uh, delivering those super cans. Now, as it relates to snow, we've got about 300 pieces of equipment out there, extra equipment out. Um, we are going to declare a snow emergency at 6:30 um, this evening. That's different than a state of an emergency. A snow emergency is only for parking, so you need to look for where those signs are. Usually, those signs are pretty high up on the pole. And they're the prob primarily the um, main streets like Connecticut Avenue, Wisconsin Avenue, New York Avenue, uh, Rhode Island Avenue. So uh, we're going to do that because of the amount of snow. We just need to get to curb to curb. The big question is, do we have salt? And, uh, yes, we do have salt. We have about 28,000 tons. To date, we've used about 27,000 tons. So uh, we expect to use about half of that amount, about 14,000 tons, for this event. How environmentally friendly is the salt we use, all the salt we well, use? That's always it? It, it's as friendly as it can be. What a, what a great <laughs> question. <laughs> but it was sustainable it is. It is. And, it, and it's the same salt that every jurisdiction uses. And, uh, we try to minimize the, the amount. We try to use the, uh, as um, less amount of salt that we can. But the, the main thing is uh, pedestrian safety, vehicle safety, and so we're, we're trying to keep the ice off the streets. You're thinking uh, about shutting the government down, asking employees not to come in, or are you waiting for the federal government? Yeah, we would do, uh, Bruce, what we normally do. It has consult with our federal partners, our regional uh, partners as well. 
And, you know, wherever possible, we'll try to make a, um, a decision that is uh, consistent, uniform uh, across the uh, region. Um, obviously, we would prefer not to have to close down the government or even close down our schools, but if we get the amount of snow uh, that we thought we might, it could lead to that. Um, we should, you know, we should have, um, a, I won't say a decision, but we should know whether we can make a decision by the, even, by the 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock news uh, later tonight. That notwithstanding, if, it, if we aren't at that point, then we will have something very early in the morning, probably around 3 o'clock uh, in the morning. But I've asked our agencies in the past, and again in this instance, to uh, do everything they can to get us to a sound recommendation so that by the 11 o'clock news tonight, uh, parents especially will know uh, what the situation is uh, with the schools. Um, by the way, uh, I was talking to, to folks at DDOT yesterday. I know this will be exciting news to you all. Do you all realize that since January 1st, they have filled 5,700 potholes? I mean, that's pretty big stuff uh, to folks, uh, some of which, of course, is, uh, I guess, caused by the salt uh, that we use on the streets. That's why we're investigating from an environmental perspective whether pepper uh, might uh, make any impact on <laughs> supposed to be funny, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just trying to process 5,700. I mean, so how many are unfilled? How many calls you get in a day for potholes? Well, some of it is calls, uh, and DDOC can better answer that uh, to me. I don't know if Sam is still uh, in here and might be able to. Okay. You can, oh, Reggie. Come on, Reggie. Yeah. We asked him, Bruce, to uh, tweet us or to call 311 and report the potholes to the borough. I don't know the number. I can get that for you, though. They come in through. Yeah. Go ahead. Divide, divide by six weeks, Bruce, the uh, 5,700, and you probably get the average of uh, calls, you know. And some, and some of it is we, some of it are, are potholes that are discovered by other people, like myself. Uh, I, I'll, I'll discover a pothole. You hit, you know, hit one in the street. And, boy, there's nothing that angers people more than hitting one of those potholes and feel like your front end just went, you know, in the other direction. So I think it's a multiplicity of avenues that we get the uh, information from. But a lot of it is people tweeting us or, or calling 311 with the uh, information. Again, if you – if you, probably the easier question to answer is, um, you know, how many, how many days have we had? 31 plus uh, – what's the day? The 12th? 12th. So – 31, 20, that's 43. So that's a lot. That's that's probably 125 uh, uh, pieces of information on, a, on an average day uh, that we get about potholes. I think what's amazing is not only do we get the calls, but they fill that many potholes. Uh, uh, we have Pothole Palooza uh, coming up in March, uh, and that will seek to finish out. Yes, it is Pothole Palooza, guys. <laughs> and anybody ever seen that machine we use? It is, it is something else, man. Uh, it, is, it is a machine that we, we obviously couldn't afford to buy one of those, nor would we need it. But we rent this machine, and uh, it goes around filling up potholes. You watch it spray this tar, and, you know, it helps to scoop out the hole, shapes it, and then sprays this tar uh, and asphalt right into the hole. Isn't that exciting? Very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Matt. Mad and mad. I, I had a uh, question for Mr. Howlett, if that's okay. When it comes to snow emergencies, I don't think we've had one in a while, and there's new residents moving in, and sometimes people can get confused about the parking restrictions. Can you explain what takes place if people don't move their cars during a right. situation um, like this? Right. The 2010 was the last time that we've uh, implemented a snow emergency. So um, a lot of our um, primary routes, we allow people to park because parking's so tight. Um, so primarily there are the snow emergency routes are where rush hour is. Um, a rush hour ticket is a $100 ticket. A snow emergency ticket is a $250 ticket plus the cost of tow and storage. So all in all, in all it's going to be about a $400 ticket if you get towed for a snow emergency. So 6.30, at 6.30 p.m. it goes into effect. So 6.30 p.m. So what we, we want is – and your general parking signs are – maybe 10 feet off the ground. The snow emergency signs are like 15, 20 feet up in the air. So you just need to look. And, and, and again, it's your primary roads that you need to be concerned about. I don't think there's a single 
residential road that has a, a snow emergency. And Bill, where, where do you tell the vehicles to? Well, there are a couple of things because we usually uh, because um, we use a lot of private companies. So it would be the private company, and, and they would need to call the um, towing control center to find out exactly which company has their vehicle. Some of, them, some of them will be towed by DPW, and they'll go down to Blue Plains, but some of them will be towed by the private companies and because we need their assistance on, in something like this. Will some just be towed around the corner? No, we will not. You're taking it. We're going to impound every snow emergency vehicle. <laughs> The, 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 the problem is it will waste as much time trying to find a place to put it because um, parking is so tight, it's just a lot easier to take it to the impoundment. <laughs> <Right. laughs> well, he uses Metro, I know that. So, All right, the, the other thing is that, that while I have a chance is that um, we're asking, you know, everyone to be a good neighbor, shovel your walk, businesses, residents. If you have seniors or disabled uh, neighbors, you know, if you can help them out and shovel their walk as well, that would be helpful. I know you know the answer. You've been around. So in 2010, we had that last snow emergency. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have any figures how many vehicles you know, were taken to tow, how much money, blah, blah, any of that kind of stuff? I have no idea. Is it a general fund? Or? Yeah. Oh, that goes to the general fund. Okay. So, uh, you know, I, 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 to be honest, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I would assume there was at least 100 vehicles that get towed, but, but, but I don't know. I have no idea. We try to make it enough, Ruth, to pay for the salt and the. To that end, Mr. Mayor, how, how is the budget looking uh, given the winter we've had so far? Um, I think we're actually going to exceed the budget. Uh, we, we realized that as we got further into this, because as you, we, if, if you think about it, the weather events that we've had this year probably are equivalent to the three, last three years um, combined. Um, so I think we're going to exceed the budget, but this is one of those functions where you have to, we'll have to figure it out. We'll figure it out uh, in terms of making sure that we continue. And I, I really want to say uh, what a great job uh, Bill and DPW and Terry and DDOT have done uh, in helping to make sure that the streets stay clean, get the snow off the streets, uh, and working to encourage people to take responsibility for these sidewalks because those are – the responsibility of the citizens, not the uh, city. So, again, uh, we know all you got to do is have one mess up uh, with snow, and then that becomes headline uh, news electronically or in print. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Uh, they've done a great job. Have you all exceeded the budget, or, or do you think this storm will, will put you over? I think this storm. We pr I think we're close to it now, uh, Matt, and I'm pretty sure this storm will put us over. But again, let me let me say that. I can't imagine anybody arguing with us about reprogramming money uh, for this. I mean, imagine we stood up and said, we've balanced the budget, guys. I know we didn't get the snow up, but the budget's balanced. Bill. Uh, so Harry Tregoni is leaving the Office of Planning. Do you have a person in mind to replace her and a timeline on when she'll be replaced by? No. In fact, I'm glad you mentioned that because I was going to ask Harriet to come up. I want to say thanks for the work that Harriet has done. Uh, she has worked uh, hard on <laughs> – Uh, she was one of the when, – when I decided I wanted to do this sustainable uh, D.C. plan, uh, Harriet was one of two people that I asked to come to my office, and she really has been a major contributor uh, to being able to get us where we are today. So I'm glad you, you asked that because I was going to ask her to come up just to say thanks uh, for the work that she's done. Uh, she's been recruited, as many of you know, by the federal government. Um, I feel like we're becoming a training ground. Uh, for the uh, federal government, not really, but because Harriet is a very talented uh, person, and uh, if you'd like, I'd like to have you say a word or two. Thank you so much. Um, I'm 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 surprised. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I'm excited to have been associated with uh, um, uh, this administration, and very very proud of this plan and how much momentum it already has. Uh, towards implementation, so many things are uh, already being done, and, and these grants really exemplify uh, the willingness of this government to innovate, um, to invest in the future, um, and to really deliver the kind of results that will make us the most sustainable city in the, in the country, um, I think actually well before 2032. So it's been a privilege to work with all of you on this great initiative. I appreciate your passion 
um, and your diligence and your creativity. It's been fantastic. It's it's sort of heartbreaking for me to, to leave. It's been such a great job, It's uh, and it's been such a, um, an honor to serve the citizens of the District of Columbia. But I will uh, be out there among your ranks, uh, you know, a continued resident of the District of Columbia, um, egging everyone on and doing my part to make the city as sustainable as it can be. So thank you all very much, and thank you, Mayor Gray. I think the other part of your question was uh, who's next, I guess. Uh, we, we undoubtedly will have somebody as an interim, you know, until we make whatever decisions need to be made in that regard, and probably will be somebody from within the Office of Planning. Mike? Uh, one of the things that is not next to Harriet's going to leave that, that isn't quite finished yet is the zoning rewrite, which is supposed to be going to the Zoning Commission at some point in the next couple months. They're actually going to set it down and take the vote. They're still doing these hearings. But is there? We, we delivered it to the Zoning Commission. The decision is now in their hands. They're going through their own process to make a decision. But basically, you know, the. Yes. Yes. They're not taking any more testimony. I mean, our office will answer questions that they have and do other things. But right, we're not testifying any longer. We're not. You know, we're not, uh, you know, we're still working with uh, members of the community that are interested in learning more about it. We're still doing those kinds of things, but the decision is in the hands of the Zoning Commission. So, you know, we're, we're, we're done with that. The council uh, is done with that. So, yeah. It's still their decision to make, though. Well, uh, last week Michael Brown explained how he obtained shadow campaign-like help for one of his campaigns. You mentioned you didn't know about the shadow campaign involved in your 2010 effort. Did this give you insight into uh, the shadow campaign in 2010? No. Uh, the D.C. Tax Revision Commission had a meeting at, I think, at 2.30 with Mayor Williams testifying. Have you submitted testimony on the results there? What are you supporting? What are you not supporting in terms of the $100 fee on every private employee? Uh, in, in the city for businesses, the middle class uh, new tax bracket. Is there anything in there that stands out to you that's got to be done or you want to focus on? Well, there's a lot of moving parts uh, there, and it really, they really are moving parts because if you change this, it affects the bottom line. Um, one, one of the things that I want to do, uh, Tom, is, and, and we're in the course of doing, is look at the spending side of the fiscal year 15 uh, budget. For example, we know education. I mean, it's a good thing, but we know the enrollment will go up again uh, next uh, fiscal next school year. How much will that cost the city? How much will the adequacy study uh, cost us? So I want to look at the spending side of things. That will give us an idea then once we get the revenue estimate, which we don't have, uh, we will know what's available to us. And then I think I'll be in a better position to be able to say, you know, what we'll support and what we don't support. I do have the same concern you raised about this fee that would be imposed upon uh, employees in the private sector because a lot of nonprofits uh, would be uh, in that situation. We have some nonprofits that are very small. I think it's $25 per quarter they would be imposing or $100 a year. Um, for some, it will be inconsequential. For other very large nonprofits, it will be like universities or hospitals, it will be a very substantial amount. So I am concerned about that. I'm looking forward to seeing the testimony uh, today and hearing, you know, meeting with uh, 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 Chairman Mendelson uh, and hearing from him and his colleagues about where they stand on it. But I think, uh, you know, we have $18 million now that was set aside by the council uh, in this budget for tax relief. So we start with a plus uh, there. The question is, if we think there are other good ideas that go beyond $18 million, um, how will we fund those? Will we fund more tax relief or will the things that we have to fund in terms of spending uh, in the budget, um, you know, consume the additional money? Okay, Mike, you have the last question. Uh, I just want, I want to return to Snow for a second. Mm -hmm. um, can you address the <laughs> – a bill will be relieved to know. This is about the political dimensions of Snow. You know, we're in the, you're obviously you're in the middle of a re-election campaign. You remember four years ago we had – some pretty big snowstorms, and I think that that uh, some people used, you know, that was one thing that they judged the mayor's leadership on. What would you like the residents of the district, how would you like them to judge 
your leadership in the ter in the in the in terms of handling the snowstorm? How would you expect them to look at this? Well, I hope they will say that Gray had a snowball. <laughs> well, you know, in all seriousness, um, we we take we take snow very seriously, um, and uh, we know we saw what happened uh, in Atlanta and I guess it's Fulton County. Uh, what happened with that? Uh, I happen to know Mayor Reed. I know him well. He is a great uh, mayor, um, and um, y you know he had to. He was left with explaining some things that I don't even think were entirely the uh, jurisdiction of the city of Atlanta. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where we have to explain not being able to clean up the city and clean up the city quickly. What we've heard, frankly, in the last, uh, you know, last couple of years, even though we haven't had that much snow, uh, we've had a lot this year, and people have been very happy with the uh, way we've gotten it off the street, and we want to continue with that, Mike. Could be, could be, yeah. Uh, you know, we had one, I think I've been in office not even 30 days, and we had that ice storm um, that we uh, addressed along with the surrounding region. Um, we've had snow, we've had a lot of snow uh, this year, uh, but this could be the biggest storm in the last um, three years. But I think we're prepared. I I go out with uh, with Bill Howland, with Terry Bellamy and others. They, they have uh, rehearsals. Uh, for want of a better way of putting it. We were out, I think it was November 1st, where everybody mobilized in the RFK Stadium parking lot. And um, they, they folks were deployed. Uh, we've invested $4.5 million uh, in additional equipment. Um, many of our trucks now are equipped even with GPS devices that will let the drivers uh, know whether a street has been, has been uh, plowed already or not. So they won't have to go down that street in order to find out. Or if they go down that street, it's because uh, additional plowing is required. So up, upped our game um, in terms of the uh, sophistication of the techniques that we use, the sophistication uh, of the equipment. And, um, you know, I have full confidence in DPW and DDOT to be able to get this job done, Bill. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> said to Terry and Bill, like, you know, listen, of all the things you do, snow, it's my hide on the line, and you guys got to get this right. We understand. Yeah, I mean, I've said things like, you know, uh, Terry, Bill, uh, if we mess up with the snow, um, don't call me for a recommendation for your next job, okay? <laughs> <laughs> no, they, they understand. They understand. They're professionals. They understand the gravity uh, of this. And um, they get it done, period. I don't know how to put it other than that. Thank you all very much.